Welcome to Frost & Sullivan's Growth, Innovation, and Leadership Briefing. Today's event is titled, Our World in 2025 to 2030, Top 12 Transformational Shifts to 2030. Our presenters today are Arjuna Vita Shekhar, Global Research Director, and also Richard Sear, Partner and Senior Vice President. Both of them are part of our Visionary Innovation Group here at Frost and & Sullivan. And it is our pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Neil Sahota, IBM Master Inventor, United Nations Artificial Intelligence Subject Matter Expert, and Professor at UC Irvine. With that, I would now like to hand the presentation over to Archana. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Anna, and welcome to everyone dialed into the briefing. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Archana Vidya Shrika from the Visionary Innovation Group at Frost and Sullivan. Um, <clears throat> so, to set the context for today's discussion, let me start by introducing you to our Megatrend universe. Um, as you can see, there are 13 megatrends um, on the slide here. Uh, now, these are trends that we track on a day-to-day -day basis in our team, um, and it's a pretty broad range of um, social technology and um, industry trends. As you can see, we cover future of mobility, healthcare, and also um, future of energy. Now, while these are extremely relevant uh, trends when viewed in silos, um, it's the convergence of these trends we find that bring forth the most exciting opportunities. For example, when 6G zero latency speed, um, a quantum computer, and long-range EV batteries are meshed together, we could end up with autonomous electric vehicles, and that is the future of mobility. So to identify similar opportunities, uh, we undertook an exercise within the team to map out the convergences between the trends and the subtrends, the outcome of which are the 12 transformational themes um, you see on this particular slide. Uh, my apologies, it is a little bit of a crowded slide with a lot of text in it, but as you can see, um, <clears throat> some of these are potentially, uh, you can perceive them as strategic outcomes uh, or even common scenarios for literally all businesses listening in today, whether it's data as the 21st century gold or virtual reality uh, or industry platforms and even AI, they are all going from common denominators and viability. Now, an interesting observation to make with these themes is that not all of them are opportunities, or in other words, positive scenarios. Some of them represent complexity. Some of them... Um, could bring about huge challenges, actually. And in some cases, they can also be considered threats to the future viability of your business and even markets that you operate in. For example, one of the themes here in, in the bottom row is um, uh, uberization of industries, which traces the uh, impact of the sharing economy. Uh, while using digital platforms such as Uber um, has, to a great extent, brought about efficiency, especially in the ride healing market, it also means that we will no longer need traditional brokers uh, to procure services for us. But throw in blockchain in the mix as the infrastructure for all the payment processing and back-end services, you can completely do away with middlemen in the value chain. You're potentially looking at complete disintermediation. Um, let's take another theme here, like the rise of platform economy. But yesterday, we heard the terrible news of a travel company, Thomas Cook, going under. It has, I think, close to 154 years of history in um, um, organizing travel and booking travel services. While online platforms such as Expedia are not entirely to blame, uh, they definitely had a role to play in Thomas Cook's downturn. So these themes in that sense are multidimensional, and we really would have liked to dive into all of the 12 themes today and uh, discuss both the positive and the negative scenarios. But unfortunately, we only have a limited time at our disposal. So we have chosen to sort of deep dive into four topics today, which are highlighted in um, red here, outlined in red here, uh, transhumanism, autonomous world, the heterogeneous society, and the zero latency world. Um, so let's start with the first theme of the day, which is transhumanism. And this is a theme that 
I'm personally very curious about and something that clearly involves all of us, the future of human beings and, and the future of humanity. Um, what we're predicting is an extreme reliance on technology when it comes to all aspects of our evolution, whether it may be our bodies, our thoughts, and even our behavior. Specifically looking at our biological evolution, in the coming years, we potentially could see the introduction of a lot of body augmentation capabilities and technologies that will enable humans to become smarter, stronger, and even more capable than we are today. Wearables in that sense will be a key uh, technology that will be introduced for body augmentation, but they will be much more smarter and intelligent than the basic fitness trackers we have in our market today. In the future, in fact, we can expect to see the arrival of contact lenses that can take pictures and videos, potentially universal language translator earbuds that would allow us to communicate anywhere in the world and even exosuits that increase physical strength. While that is body augmentation, our brains and thoughts in the future will also be, and this will be enabled through better human-machine interactions via technologies such as brain implants and wearable headsets. Facebook, for example, announced last year that they were creating a device that would allow typing straight from the brain, you don't have to use your fingers, at the speed of 100 words per minute. Uh, for comparison, Neuralink, uh, which is an Elon Musk company, they are striving to develop a similar device that would be able to, um, again, use brain signals to type at 60 words per minute. And that's the average speed. I mean, even if you were to type with fingers, even if you are a teenager or Gen Z, that is the speed, 60 to 100 words per minute. So it's quite interesting. And while most of these companies, the, you know, the technologies that they're developing right now in the short term are very much focused in medical applications, uh, these companies are also quite confident when it comes to um, seeing these technologies sort of cross over to consumer applications seamlessly. So like our bodies um, and um, our thoughts um, being influenced very heavily by technology, the other aspect of humanity, behavior, is also being conditioned uh, greatly by technology influence. And we've all experienced this in some measure, whether it may be Netflix viewing episodes uh, or Amazon with, it, or with its many, many notifications. Uh, we've all been sort of conditioned to... Uh, technology leveraging our behavioral patterns and using that to help us make the right choice. Um, and similar tactics can be employed to drive some really positive outcomes in other contexts as well. For example, imagine an IT department in a huge corporation that leverages behavioral analytics to ensure all employees lock their laptops to prevent cyber attacks and uh, other threats. And believe it or not, um, employee negligence is one of the prime factors for cyber attacks and breaches. And this is not to be confused with um, the typical carrot and stick approach that you're used to where you either incentivize or penalize people for the choices you make, but it is really about sort of understanding intrinsically the behavioral patterns of people and using that to cue the right choices to them. And the idea is all of those options and all of those choices you pose to your consumers, the citizens, they all should end in a positive outcome for your company. So at this point, um, I'd like to uh, invite our panelists to weigh in on this theme of transhumanism. And my first question is to uh, Richard. Richard, you just touched upon nudge tactics. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about approaches to behavioral analytics that you've seen and how it is being leveraged to drive positive outcomes? Sure, yeah. And uh, Archana, thanks for your uh, introduction. And I uh, just want to say it would be remiss of me as the... the uh, the group uh, leader that, to, to say how proud I am of the work that you guys have done. So fantastic job. Um, so I would argue zero is, um, you know, really not zero disease. Um, you know, th there are a lot of things to, to discuss in this space and, and to try and get it into a brief period is going to be quite difficult. But basically, uh, as I see it, um, diseases have a natural ability to evolve. And, you know, we see that already with antibiotic uh, resistance increasing. Um, not decreasing, unfortunately. So it's one of those, you know, in incredible uh, threats uh, to humanity, and, and to be frank, you know, affecting health, food supply, and security. So, 
you know, transhumanism can make impacts, um, but I really think the question is best framed as to what degree can human-based science evolve faster than natural-based science. So in this case, the human-based science really discussing the, the implications of transhumanism, the embedding of technology onto the human form or inside the human form. So, you know, if, if, you, if we take that, though, you know, a growing number of infections, things like tuberculosis, um, gonorrhea, salmonellosis, uh, are all becoming harder to treat because of resistance to antibiotics. And, and, and this is factoring in computing power increase over the last, you know, a few decades. So uh, this one is a difficult one because I hate to be pessimistic to begin. Um, but if we do factor in this sort of broader disease context, and I, I, I do find that it is... Um, isn't going to get us completely there, but what I think it does make a huge impact on, and where I believe strongly in this, this notion of zero focus, is, is it improves innovation. And you only need to head towards people like, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with their efforts to, to you know, to focus on um, sanitation, especially in, you know, in, in regions uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia, you know, to, to see the impact that, that it has. But the actual zero, no. Heavy progression towards zero? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Yeah, no, th thank you, Richard. So you see uh, zero diseases and scenarios um, like that potentially being one of the more, hopefully, one of the more positive outcomes that could come out of approaches such as transhumanism. Um, and I'd like to Neil to weigh in on that, uh, given some of the work that he's done around AI. Um, I mean, it, this is quite an interesting development, obviously technology being able to augment us and maybe potentially delivering on zero diseases. Um, but the concept of technology controlling us is also, uh, let's face it, very terrifying. Um, so despite the fear around AI and, you know, singularity, why are we still moving towards transhumanism? I mean, what, what are some of the other sort of key positive impacts you see in this evolution towards transhumanism? Great uh, question. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, fears, opportunity, both there. At the end of the day, AI, like all technology, is a tool. It's all about how we wield it. But I think in our quest as people, as humans, to constantly try to improve ourselves, there's some new opportunities. So, for you know, for example, we've already we've seen some experimental surgeries where they're able to put in digital cameras into a blind person's eyes and actually transmit the image to the brain. So it's, it's black and white. It's a little, little fuzzy, but suddenly we're enabling people that can never see to actually, you know, see. And, you know, one of the areas that artificial intelligence is actually focused on is um, not just provide these up, uh, capabilities, but, like, you think about someone that's lost a limb. So mm -hmm. the brain is actually still able to transmit signals to the stump, people are actually working on AI to try and you know, decode what those signals mean, look at some visual clues, and actually allow a person to manipulate like an artificial hand, artificial foot, so it'll actually restore some more sense of, uh, you know, mobility, I'll, I'll call it. And, you know, that's, that's you know, a little earth shattering when you consider that maybe now losing a limb is not the end of the world. On the same token, you were talking about behavior, you know, develop things around artificial empathy and actually are helping us become better communicators. So imagine, you know, being able to read the emotional state of a person better, to, you know, understand their psychographic profile or personality better and say, you know what, rather than just speak like we normally do, what if I now know that this is the best way to communicate, that this person doesn't care more about, like, you know, the, the hard facts, so this person needs a little more nurturing, you know, a little more reassurance that could actually be a huge opportunity for us as people, not just in like trying to sell stuff, but just being able to compute, uh, sorry, communicate with our loved ones. I mean, think just parent to child. It's a, it's a very unique opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it was maybe, maybe it was last month that uh, Microsoft uh, introduced this um, uh, HoloLens technology where it leveraged hologram and speech to text and text to speech sort of AI applications uh, um, as, as a kind of a use case for virtual conferences where an American was basically delivering virtually through a hologram a presentation in Japanese. So I guess, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting, um, you know, the many possibilities with um, transhumanism and ways in which we can really embrace technology to kind of 
overcome some of the barriers that we have. So great. Well, uh, thank you both. Um, that sort of rounds up our perspective on transhumanism. And, uh, you know, we have to keep uh, the presentation going. But if you have any questions on this topic, please do plug in your questions in towards the end of the session. Um, the next thing we have uh, for the day is zero latency. Um, now, working ahead to 2030, especially, that is uh, latency, that is the delay before a transfer of data begins following an instruction, will become extremely important for IoT and communication use cases. For example, low latency will be essential for real-time interactivity of devices and will also become crucial for applications such as self-driving cars and virtual reality. I mean, just imagine a car uh, buffering on the highway if it's autonomous. I mean, that will be a major safety concern. So as you can see um, on the illustration here on the slide, on the top right corner, uh, the applications listed in the blue shaded area are services that can be offered with the existing infrastructure 4G. Um, and for the ones uh, that are mapped outside of the blue shaded area, the availability of 5G and the imminent introduction of 6G will, will be very, very crucial, um, like virtual reality, autonomous driving, augmented reality, et cetera. So there's no telling right now, but even with the first iterations of 5G, uh, we've seen everyday speeds of up to one gigabyte per second. 6G will absolutely talk that, uh, but how much is still in question? Um, but what we're seeing, from the trials and some of these uh, telecom carriers claimed that we might be several hundred, hundred uh, gigabit per second speed or even ranges. Being an our expert uh, on this topic, um, question to Richard. Uh, Richard, you were recently in Europe, I think, uh, discussing 6G with a major telecom operator. Uh, what can you tell us? What can we expect to see in this space? Well, I mean, you know, this is an area where I'm um, very excited, Archana, and uh, I think you, you know that for me. This is uh, kind of the area where I, where I tend to geek out because, um, I mean, we have to begin first with the primary differences, just if we just look at some numbers between 5G and, and what 6G will have. I mean, 5G, we already know, um, you know, most, uh, most mobile operators have signed agreements on 5G infrastructure, so we're starting to see that, even some in some of the remote parts of the world that are in developing stage for uh, for communications technology. I mean, they're leapfrogging in some cases if their supplier agreements allow. So, you know, that's great. But, but, but you know, you just have to look at the R&D that's happening. And we're already searching for limitations with 5G um, so that we can continue progressing. And I've always looked to Europe for this space. I think that's, that's, that's it's fair to say and suggest that, that that's where most of the innovation has taken place. Um, and if we're looking especially at the equipment market, I would argue that that's very true. But 6G, the primary difference, just in a nutshell, is 6G is, is driven by AI, wide-scale algorithms and sort of traditional uh, methods of being able to, to extract value from, from the network. Um, and it's a real big difference um, when we shift to an AI-based um, network management platform. So with 5G, if we just look at it, the very first networks really have been providing us with about 600 megabits per second, and that's leaving a lot of room for improvement. Uh, I think we're going to see that you know, increasing relatively substantially over the, the coming five to six years. Just as a reference point, by the way, 5G is around 28 to 30 megabits per second. So you can, you can see the comparative differences there. Um, and, and 5G provides us with limitless connections versus 4G. Um, and that's really important, especially, you know, in the overused and overhyped uh, area of Internet of Things that allowed us to plug in a lot of uh, devices and access points to the network. So, so primarily for me, and then you can talk about things like latency, of course, sub 10 milliseconds. So primarily for me, um, you know, 6G will accomplish two core objectives. Uh, one is it will completely remove latency. Um, you know, at speeds of uh, one terabit per second, which is inherently the download speed and, and there's almost zero latency. Um, the second thing that's critical is the informative amount of information that is coming off of the network from this, you know, overprescribed Internet of Things environment. Um, when managed and utilized by an artificial intelligence uh, environment w will allow for instantaneous predictivity. It will allow, allow for things like self-healing networks. Um, to instantaneously modify communication flow patterns, 
And, you know, if we think about sort of, you know, the enablement of applications that will sit on it, the autonomous world, suddenly it becomes a stark reality and becomes an insurable moment, whereas today people are thinking of it as an uninsurable moment when you think about autonomous machines. So I think it's um, unbelievably exciting uh, and certainly something that we're going to turn our attention to over the next, um, you know, few years. Neil, I'll ask you the question. So the question was, um, I think it's really around wireless connectivity speeds are essential, um, the compute aspect of it. So do you see technologies like AI and quantum computing, um, you know, delivering on this promise? Uh, great, great question. I, I think that in, in some regards there'll be a help and in some regards there'll be the fuel. Uh, in, some, in some regards there'll be the consumer. That's probably the better way to put it. Some, you know, I, I might be dating myself here, but I remember 25 years ago using a 9600 baud modem, you know, and it would take a few minutes for something to load. And, you know, today, if I have to wait more than two seconds, you know, it gets frustrating. I mean, that's maybe how spoiled we are, but even one second to a machine is an eternity. And you, we talk about trying to make these recommendations or decisions in real time where we have a fraction of a second to sometimes react. It becomes critical. And we've been so focused on software for the past 30 years that we've kind of reached the limits of hardware. And so we have to take a look and say, okay, to make things like AI and IoT and consumption of big data reality, how do we do that? And quantum computers is one source to improve computing power. One of the things that we, you know, in my IBM days we did was work with TED. And we had Watson actually watch all the TED Talks. And so there's a Watson Power search engine on there so that if you're looking for a particular subject or something like that, not only can you find the most relevant TED Talks, but you can find the segment within the talk, thanks to Watson, that you're interested in. And people have said, like, that's awesome. Why don't you do that for YouTube? Not enough computing power right now to do that. It would take an eternity to try and process all that information. And so we can see the consumption side, but there's something interesting going on in AI called generative design where we can actually work with an AI and say, hey, this is what I want to do, these are parameters. The AI can actually generate thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of different design options on trying to accomplish our goal. And then let the human, you know, engineers, designers see which one make, might make the most sense. And as a result, we're actually seeing unique types of designs pop up that we haven't thought of before that can actually enable some of these capabilities. And so I think technology like AI will help actually help us build out that infrastructure that we need. Great point. Arjun, I think you're back. Yes, hi. I'm sorry about that. Um, is my line audible now? Is this better? Yes. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Excellent, excellent. Well, this is really ir ironic. We're discussing data speeds and connectivity, and I'm having issues with the basic telephone. Uh, but I'm glad to be back on, and, and thank you, Neil. Um, okay, so uh, let's move to our next theme uh, for the day, which is um, heterogeneous society. Um, social heterogeneity is, um, as you can see in the slide, it's typically characterized by differences in income, ethnicity, gender, and age. Um, and these lines of classification to the um, looking ahead is some of these gaps that are intensifying for the more. For an age, uh, the gap is going to get wider between countries that are hyper-aged societies and hyper-young societies. For instance, the median age in Japan will be 49, while in India it will be around 29. By 20, the few countries will see women overtake the working class and consumption class while in some countries, access to jobs and basic education, unfortunately, will still be an issue. Again, for example, in Netherlands, uh, woman-to-man ratio in workforce is already at 40 to 1, whereas in developing countries, it's the complete opposite. You can flip it to 1 is to 4. Another key social division uh, is ethnicity. Surprisingly, on Chinese and not um, Islam uh, will be one of the biggest, largest single ethnic uh, the uh, group with 20% of the global population by 2030. So there are a lot of social themes that are clearly emerging. And as we think about um, globalization's next chapter as businesses, it is essential to understand that it's not just about sort of going local, uh, but also really hyper-personalizing services, 
um, as even within a region, there will be um, major differences. So again, these are the ones that you've highlighted here. These are along the you know the typical divisions that we see, but there are also other social divisions emerging uh, where the gap is becoming quite stark. For example, the electricity divide, uh, which still fascinates me. Statistics show that 35% of the developing world still goes without household electricity. Um, obviously, this has huge ramifications to IoT and other markets. And another modern-day divide that is emerging is also the digital divide. Uh, a majority of senior citizens use the Internet, but they still lag behind the general population um, by 23%, even in developed countries such as the United States of America. And this, to a great extent, can be attributed to another modern-day phenomenon, which is the generational difference that is coming up. Um, that is the rise of Gen Z and how they could potentially be very, very different from their predecessors. One of the questions that we're looking to answer through our research, and we've done uh, three very interesting studies on the topic of Gen Z, is uh, will Gen Z sort of bring back the ownership model? You know, the preceding generation, Gen Y, was largely uh, credited and uh, sort of responsible for um, propelling the gig economy and the sharing economy. And given that Gen Z is exhibiting uh, different characteristics, um, you know, most of our clients, the key question they have for us is, will they bring ownership back? Um, so let's uh, bring in our experts at this point. Um, Richard, I'll direct the first question to you. Clearly, uh, the phrase, the common man, is losing relevance. Um, so what must companies do to ensure that they retain and attract these new customers like Gen Z uh, from this heterogeneous society? Or what should they keep in mind when they are designing products for this really sort of polarizing world? Sure. Yeah, so... Um, uh I mean, clearly it's shifted substantially. I think that's 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 a no-brainer. Um, but I think, you know, humanistically, one of the challenges that we have is that we love to uh, put people into buckets. And we've done this. You've seen this with the Gen Z, Gen Y, um, yeah. Gen Xs. I mean, this is typically what we do, as, as, as especially as marketers. Um, and let me just respond a little bit to the, you, you mentioned uh, Gen, Gen Z, and I, and I do want to just clarify some areas around this where we're seeing common mistakes already taking place in marketing and you know and that's the uh, the false assumption that Gen Z and Gen Y exist in the same bucket. I, I saw this recently in a Wall Street Journal article where they were trying to illustrate the differences in you know societal demands from uh, Gen Xers versus and they put them in the bucket of, of Millennials and, and Gen Z together. Um, that is entirely and to totally inaccurate. Um, Gen Z have much more in common actually with Gen X than they do uh, with Gen Y if we were to assume the, the generalized characteristic traits. Um, but the challenge, uh, and I think the, the, the focus for folks as we look at this you know, heterogeneous society, is that you know, we talk a lot about this N equals 1 um, trend that in an era of hyper-powerful compute and a future where we are essentially paired of a light to that power, meaning, you know, inside of us, if we go back to the transhumanism trend or if we just put it in today's context of that the ability for companies to relate to us on an individual level is certainly there. But those companies must empower that capability in a trusted way with values that are directed to me and directive for me. And that's a fundamental difference in how you win in this environment, that it is not just directed to me, it is directive for me. Um, so I use an analogy of sort of a puppeteer to, to best try and illustrate this. You know, in the past, um, a marketing or sales organization would have, you know, about five strings, you know, the head and the limbs. And it was quite easy to, you know, and, I, and this is, I know, some, somewhat so oversimplified, but it's somewhat easy to, in essence, kind of, you know, manipulate information and make sure that, you know, we're able to attract a customer, retain a customer. But in today's world, that has thousands and thousands of strings attached to the human body. And so the marketing function has got to evolve very substantially um, just to comprehend the amount of informative information that the individual level over millions and millions of potential existing customers that all want to be treated as an N equals one. So it's all about nuances of personal expression. It's about nuances of culture. It's the nuances um, that brought together crack that winning value proposition. And, and that does mean that functionally um, organizations will need to adapt um, in every different dimension to, to look at this 
uh, topographies of data that exist and apply algorithms obviously to, to make the best use of those uh, you know, data sets. The worst thing that's happening you know, is the creation of these uh, amorphous terms like data lakes um, which bring to mind a pool of very large meaningless information uh, of which it's very hard to extract. So, so I think it's going to be a very interesting area. I'm certainly watching it very closely, but that personal touch is extremely important. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, my next question is to Niels. Um, Neil, uh, we kind of discussed uh, digital divide um, earlier on. Um, what is the future of work in this context? Are we losing our jobs to AI? I mean, that's definitely in the news a lot. Um, and will, we, will all countries see similar trends? It's a great question. I know that, uh, you know, it's a great fear, legitimate fear. I, I don't think it's so much the technology that's a concern with the speed of change. Um, throughout human history, there's always been new technology and always a shifting of jobs. Uh, you know, for example, 10 years ago, we didn't have Uber drivers or social media marketers. I think the, the challenge that we're facing, especially with AI, is that it's not so much we're losing jobs, but we know that jobs will be lost, but new jobs will be created. How quickly can we actually get ready for those new jobs? Because the you know there's there's a lot of emphasis on you know STEM or STEAM types of skills, as well as more critical thinking and personal types of skills. So what do we actually do about that? What do we do about areas that may be underserved or less developed? Um, the question, I think the key thing is we have to obviously get ready, but can we change our systems or trains fast enough to adapt in time? We have companies already like Amazon that are starting their own universities so that they can actually teach the skills they want their employees to have. So they're willing to hire and train that way. But you could think about underserved areas. Do they have the infrastructure to actually support some of these changes? You can't just say, I'm going to give everyone iPads in, you know, Africa if they don't have the electricity and other things to charge it, if they don't have the high-speed Wi-Fi Internet connection, the value is muted. But that being said, I think there's actually a unique opportunity for these companies that are, quote, unquote, behind to actually leapfrog ahead. If you look at China and Africa, for example, they never had a landline culture, so to speak. They never had that infrastructure. But when mobile devices came out, especially smartphones, they actually leapfrogged the head straight into that. And that's one of the reasons why they're actually leaders in terms of like mobile applications, especially like you know, mobile payment. Like I can tell you right now, I've you know spent quite a bit of time in China. There are places now that they don't take cash or credit card; they only take AliPay, WeChat Pay, because for them, mobile payment's the norm. So I think it's really a question of we all know getting ready, but realizing that we have a short window to actually do that. These aren't things that aren't going to happen, you know, in, in 15 years. These are things that are going to happen in like three to five years. And so we really got to put the the onus on ourselves to say these. This is what future work is going to be like. These are the skills and knowledge we have to get people. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think the you know this whole conversation around uh, digital haves and have nots is, is very interesting. Um, we were uh, within my team. We were looking at the teachers' education, and we also kind of picked up that trend that you talked about. That some of these countries really leapfrogging when it comes to technology, like Africa, for example. Uh, they use some of the more advanced uh, cognitive uh, adaptive tests when it comes to uh, K-12 education. So yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this is uh, certainly uh, a very exciting space to watch, and it's a huge, huge context. I think the heterogeneous society for all of the uh, things um, that we discussed today. I mean, we can create a lot of innovative products, but if there is no consumer acceptance and if there is no incentive uh, for the consumer to change, you know, um, you're really hitting a wall there. Okay, so. Um, uh, we uh, will be uh, moving on to the next and final theme for the day now. Uh, it's autonomous world. Now, we've heard a lot about uh, drones and autonomous cars. It's uh, certainly stirred up a lot of conversation. Um, while these are critical and integral part of our view uh, of the future, we really would like to focus today a little bit on other types of um, autonomous systems within other industries that could potentially go either semi-autonomous or fully autonomous before the 2030 timeline. 
what you see here on this uh, slide is a sort of a timeline radar map uh, that shows you both from a product and processes perspective uh, and different industries and examples where autonomy is being embraced in a big way. Now, the idea of autonomy was not necessarily something that was uh, first positioned by, uh, you know, Google with a self-driving car or even Amazon with a drone. In fact, if you trace back its history, it was actually the humble forklift uh, was first um, retrofitted into a autonomous system. I think it was a startup by the name of Secret that came up with the idea of uh, uh, instrumenting a forklift with a vision guiding camera system, uh, uh, putting a lot of tactile sensors on it, and also using uh, literally barcode labels on the floors of the warehouse and path programming software to pretty much help the forklift run itself autonomously. And that's the same idea really uh, with autonomous cars as well, the combination of uh, really intelligent sensors, um, 3D vision cameras, and uh, uh, programming of uh, decision making and uh, path uh, taking, et cetera. Uh, now, as you can see here, there are a lot of um, uh, technologies that we've mapped, and a couple of them are very, very interesting. Uh, if you look at Toyota, uh, the transport division of Toyota, they're working on automated guided container transport systems. Um, that will be employed in storage yards. They will be leveraging software technologies to synchronize and optimize the loading and unloading in, in very busy uh, shipping ports. Uh, there's also the example of uh, autonomous trucks, uh, which is quite fascinating. Again, um, highway plowing trucks could be uh, semi-autonomous by 2030, and ocean-going ships, cargo ships, could also become fully autonomous by 2030, and huge manufacturers such as um, those always are working on this. And really, obviously, the, the uh, idea or the incentive with autonomous technology is the kind of ability to um, lay off human uh, reliance, um, reduce human error as a result of that, and also reduce cost, because um, labor cost in some cases is really the most important component of the whole cost structure. Uh, while the harder aspect of it is Clearly, very important, as I said, that you know the, the ability for these machines to see things through camera vision or to sense things through sensors and uh, make decisions. The software and the programming uh, angle is also extremely crucial, and this is where AI is going to play uh, a huge role because essentially, what it will enable, uh, especially with deep learning approaches, is for these softwares and these programs to go off script. Uh, you know, to not follow pre-programmed instructions and really uh, follow patterns and understand some patterns and make decisions that way. So this whole aspect is you know, constant improvement or as the Japanese would like to call it, Kaizen in business processes is, is really the philosophy behind deep learning approaches and uh, you know, using AI for decision-making purposes as far as these autonomous machines are concerned. Um, so I'd really like to hear from our panelists on this team. Um, uh, my first question will be to Neil. Uh, Neil, you've been a master inventor at IBM, uh, credited for your work with AI. Um, you know, a lot of these um, applications that we discussed today, they were all what I would maybe put under the narrow intelligence bucket. Uh, but I think the big question is uh, how far away is general AI? Um, are we, uh, are, are machines and technology there yet in terms of uh, taking some of those? Uh, decision-making challenges from, a, you know, uh, having a general disposition to make decisions like humans do? Well, the, the simple answer is the machines aren't there yet. Um, yeah. The AI that we have is what we call artificial narrow intelligence, meaning they can only do what we taught them to do, and they're a very passive system. They only respond to queries, so they're not out trying to learn new things. To get to that AGI, though, that's the big question. You know, I know several people who think it's 10, 20 years away, might be a never away. But, you know, a good friend of mine, Peter Voss, the guy who actually coined AGI, he's actually working on something right now. And his feeling is that because there's so much focus on commercializing the technology, and rightfully so, because it's a huge investment, that people are looking at A and I a lot, but not making the investment into research on AGI. And so he's actually taken the initiative himself to do that. 
and I've actually seen a, a rough prototype, and I've been actually very impressed with what they put together. I I actually feel like we could hit AGI in the next 10 years. Um, imagine, you know, it's either it's a great opportunity or it's really scary for people, but imagine a machine that actually has the ability to, to ask questions, learn on its own, and actually try and figure out new things and not be always dependent on it. That, you know, even simple things like I worry about repeating all the information again, the machine actually understands what I'm trying to say. It remembers what we talked about two minutes ago. It's actually really powerful stuff. That's kind of the holy grail a lot of people are shooting for is this you know, personalized AI assistant. We very much need AGI for that. And uh, I'm excited to say that I probably might see that in my lifetime. Well, that's, um, that's, that's pretty exciting. Did you say uh, 10 years before uh, general intelligence could be applied? I think so. I think in the next 10 yeah. years we'll, we'll, we'll see it. I think it will obviously it'll be like a little kiddly rudimentary, but it learns fast. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Um, so Richard, what are your thoughts on that in terms of um, timelines to yeah. uh, general <laughs> intelligence autonomy? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm going to take a, tight, a slightly different angle. So I think one of the, one of the challenges with this um, is the definition of ANI, AGI, and then of course ultimately ASI, which is uh, artificial super intelligence. Um, and I just really want to express that ASI is 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 really what we see in kind of Westworld. Um, you know, AGI in its strictest definition is parity, meaning that uh, it takes um, and is capable of the same tasks and the same capabilities as a human. So if I'm to take it as its strictest definition, for me, um, we have to see an awful lot of things happen which we are nowhere near close to see happening and, and that's all, for me, down to compute power. Um, we have to see massive scale qubit stabilization to occur in the quantum computing industry in order for us to even get close to the compute power that is required to, to mimic the human brain. Um, in, in parallel to that, because that's just compute power, we then have to be able to teach those uh, compute powers to, to be able to mimic the way that we think, whether it's atom, dendrites, somos, synapsis, all of these things that have to be firing, of which you know we have um, more than can even be feasibly understood as stars in the galaxy. So, I mean, I, for me, when I think about AGI, I do think about it, and this is perhaps the sort of the market um, intelligence expert in me versus the brilliant inventor and creator, which you may have in Neil, um, or you do have in Neil, I should say, uh, that I tend to sort of, you know, have these delineated cutoff marks. And if I was to create that delineated cutoff mark, I can't see that. And, uh, you know, I obviously speak to a lot of AI experts uh, before 2040. Um, now, again, I'm always uh, surprised by timelines, so I, I very well could be sooner uh, the, than that, but again, I'm using a definition which I think is perhaps a little stricter than the one that maybe Neil was using, which I would fully agree with, um, you know, interactive uh, assistants that can have conversational architect, that's, that's in existence now. I mean, we, we've, we've seen that, uh, and will they advance uh, exponentially? Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I just probably argue that, that that for me isn't AGI. Let me take you through the rest of the uh, rest of the content. There, there is some discussion, uh, something we were going to have around autonomy and what we expected to see um, in terms of you know, automation. What, what areas would progress faster than others? So, um, I certainly have a perspective on that, and certainly I'd love to hear Neil. So, so I don't know, Neil, do you have a perspective on automation and what you think will either empower or uh, disempower this automation of framework. I know obviously you, you work a lot in the AI space, but uh, do you have any ability, uh, any opinions on this? Um, I, 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 I do. <laughs> no surprise there's good and bad. I mean, it's good to offload some of the, I call it kind of admin level cognition tasks. You know, something like, like driving, which hopefully will free us our time to do other things. But I also worry about that some of the skills and things we might eventually lose because of that. Um, you know, I like to take the best of people and say that, you know, we're going to take on more complex work, more higher value add things, but we've also never yeah. lived the time where there's been so much entertainment. And so it's a question of which way will we actually break? Will we, 
do the more advanced work or would go binge watch Game of Thrones. I think that's going to be the big challenge in an autonomous world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, I don't know, I, just Neil, from, from my perspective, I think we've got kind of three things going on at the same time, right? We've got technology automation, uh, and this is over the next 10 years that we're thinking about this, consumer adoption preferences and then kind of the regulatory empowerment side. So, you know, what, to what degree will they allow us to do the things that technology can allow? And I think that's an interesting dichotomy. I know you've worked a lot with the UN, um, and I, I, I'd love to hear you, actually, you, uh, if we're doing a little interview now, I'd love to hear your perspective on sort of how you, you view that sort of, you know, regulatory control. We got a question from the audience around privacy, which I think is another, you know, critical thing. And so, so maybe I'll, I'll just give you my opinion on sort of that conundrum. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, largely speaking, my biggest concern is here is, is actually country-based competition. So, um, you know, if we look at places like China, uh, where they have sort of, you know, less restrictions in some places, in some cases they have uh, maybe systems and governmental systems that can allow for more widespread, you know, uh, enablement of certain technologies. Quantum is a really good example of that. You know, uh, I, I, I have a fear, um, I don't know whether it's healthy or not, but I have a fear that over the next 10 years, you know, a lot of this is going to come down to sort of, you know, re countries ability and speed in which they, 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 they enforce regulations to either empower these to happen or sort of not empower. And I feel like, especially in areas like quantum, you know, the U.S. could be at a disadvantage, um, you know, if, if it gets tied up in a lot of regulation. What, what, uh, what's your opinion on that from, uh, from your history? I 100% agree. I mean, it's, it's a big challenge in saying, like, if we overregulate, do we stifle innovation, do we fall behind other countries? And if we don't regulate enough, can we really trust the companies to self-regulate, especially given the, the data breaches or anything that we've learned? Um, I, I really think this actually is going to boil down to a moral, ethical question. Mm -hmm. um, what is right mean in terms of right use of this technology? And yeah. I will be, I would tell you guys that, you know, I, I gave a, a keynote at GSR last year. It's a big conference for the regulators around the world. And I actually made the point that we can't actually figure this out until we have a common baseline on moral and ethics to work from. Because mm -hmm. in the digital age, there's no boundaries, right? Technology can be migrated anywhere. And I will tell you, I won no friends when I said <laughs> that. You know, I, I put voice to what everyone's thinking when I wants to talk about it because it's a hard, difficult conversation. Mm. And uh, I will tell you that afterwards, one of the UN director generals ran up to me and he's like, you took, that took a lot of courage to say that. You didn't make any friends. You might want to leave, and uh, <laughs> not not great. But I will tell you a year later, guess what was happening? I actually heard the regulators openly talking about this subject and saying, like, what what is what does right behavior mean? And if we're trying to figure out regulation and what what's good, what's not good, uh, what what does that what does that really mean for us? Mm. I mean, if we have this technology, we have it like a hand help more people that have severe illness. We can reduce auto accidents. That's a great thing. But at the same token, what if someone weaponizes it? What if they do this? And it's like, we have to balance that out. I, I wish I could give everyone the, on, the, on the webinar a simple answer here, but I think this is going to boil down to that common baseline moral and ethics before we can figure this, this out. Yeah, I, yes, it's most certainly not an easy, <laughs> most certainly not an easy thing, but regulations never are, are they, Neil? So um, let me kind of just to summarize some of the key findings that we, uh, that, we, that we arrived at. Now, I just want to remind folks, uh, Arsene didn't mention this at the beginning, but um, you know, there's well over 300 pieces of content that we have in this, in this project that we undertook. It, it took nearly a year and a half to, to, to accomplish it, and obviously we tried to capture some of it in, uh, you know, in just a few minutes here, and th there are many. And we talked about the heterogeneous um, you know, future and the complexity that that has around you know, marketing and sales in the organization, the way in which you go to innovate, um, for example. Uh, the, the terabyte era arriving, I think this is uh, one of the most crucial ones, you know, as we see the arrival of, of 5, 6G, and of course then AI's ability to start to control networks um, in optimized networks is probably a better way of expressing it. And, that, and that's certainly an issue that we will see um, here very, very quickly. A couple of the others that I think are really um, super important. The personalized experience, I think, is ex especially important, especially in retail. Um, one of the trends we didn't discuss today, but is in our study, is the uh, the arrival of the digital frontier as a, 
as a frontier technology, meaning that you know, most of our interactions, the frontline technology will be some form of immersive experience and how that relates, translates and traverses into your interpersonal communications is going to be extremely important. And this is both sort of looking at things like operational tasks uh, within a company as well as sort of consumer-based tasks. And, you know, I know in the news a lot of uh, effort gets placed on the consumer stuff because it's, it's, it's certainly more interesting, more sexy. But... Um, in the business world, this has real solid applications in things like, you know, factory workers, training, first responders. Um, I, I had, just as an aside, I had a very interesting discussion with a, a, a technology innovator, a very young uh, woman. She, uh, she was absolutely brilliant from MIT, and she developed a, a technology that would allow us with transhumanism to essentially embed technology into a first responder, so, for example, a firefighter. And then based upon artificial intelligence's assessment of the danger in front, the risk factors, um, it would select the firefighter or first responder that would be most appropriate to, to tackle that task, whether it was a physical task, an emotional task, whatever it could end up being, based on the current state of that first responder. And that was fascinating. You know, it's essentially just sort of, you know, selective um, to reduce danger and the threats that, that are faced. So that's sort of an aggregation example of a lot of these issues together. So there's really a lot here, um, a lot to discuss in the study, and obviously we welcome uh, questions. You could finish by saying the way to take advantage of this. Um, you know, there's a lot of information, like I've said, different trends, the subtrends, the transformational issues that we've outlined, the opportunity analysis that we've, that we've outlined. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can work with our team, whether it's just the, the, the initial study or whether it's uh, working with us on, a, on some form of presentation to, to bring into your company, as well as things where I promise the, the technology wouldn't be an issue, um, as, as well as things like you know, in-person workshop and consulting projects. So we'd be, we'd be blessed to, uh, to work with you on any of those. But we do have a few questions, and I want to hear more from Neil because Neil um, is a super fascinating guy. And here's a question for you, Neil. Um, Humans don't have a record of using technology for improving the world. What makes us think that it will be different with this immensely powerful tool? That's a highly provocative question. Is, uh, do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I don't know if we don't have a track record. I think that we don't prioritize it as much as we probably should. Um, mm. I, 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 you know, and I, and I get that. It's a lot of commercialization, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think there's an opportunity for social enterprise. But I think we've yeah. also living in a time where people actually have more information, and there's a will to do social good. You know, let's, last Friday, there was a worldwide walkout among students to protest, you know, climate change, the lack of action against climate change for 3 million students. I mean, I think that's really impressive. I, I think the will is there. It's the mindset. We have to get into the mindset that, like, yeah, I can do a lot of great things with these things. I can make money. But at the same time I'm making money, I might be able to help the world, help the planet. And mm. I think, you know, AI is affording us the opportunity not just to do that, like, operationally, but help us with our behaviors, help us make small changes that we would be very much okay in doing but don't realize the, the aggregated impact of what that will have as a positive for the world. Mm. So I'm, you can tell I'm very optimistic, but I think, you know, things like United Nations AI for Good Initiative, for example, I'm very much trying to create that mindset. In three years, we've launched 116 social good projects. I just think we just need people that are willing to stand up and be champions and say, hey, you know what? We have a powerful tool. We can use this in a variety of ways. Let's also get the mindset of doing some social good. I think that's going to make a difference. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there's um, I think there's a couple of shifts here that I think are really important. I think one is that we're seeing a clear trend from CEOs to shift towards uh, goals around transparency, sustainability, um, social well-being, and good. And and you know the, the the recent announcement it was just a few weeks ago, of course, of the of a large group of some larger CEOs instead of just you know basically shareholder value and money ruling the roost. I think that that's an important shift. Um, that does, uh, I think, give us early signs that over the next decade we'll see more activity. And then I don't, really don't think you have to look much further than sort of uh, some of the work that's been done by um, philanthropists in, in this space 
to indicate the positive nature of this change. Um, you know, I recently watched, I, I don't know if all of you have seen this yet, but if you don't, I would actively encourage you to see the, uh, the, the Gates documentary on Inside His Brain. Um, you know, where I think it outlines uh, in a very positive way, it's easy to get dystopian on this. I fall into it myself. Um, it's easy to kind of, you know, get into that, that attitude, but this gives you a very utopian perspective of actual accomplishments as a result of using technology and, uh, and thinking to, to drive uh, change at a massive scale for the benefit of good. So look, there's always a negative side. There's always going to be privacy issues. There's always going to be security issues. There's always going to be you know, evil people, unfortunately, that will do evil tasks. But I am a, a, a big believer um, in the power of this change, certainly uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, okay, let's look at another quick question. We've got like a minute, Neil. So um, people have uh, asked questions around things like climate and ecological issues. Um, do, do we see these as, as technologies that can bring us closer to, to those? I mean, I know I sort of suggested it a little bit, but um, have, have you seen anything out there in terms of discussion-wise with your vast network where we see it being applied to these big macro issues? Yeah, there, there's a lot. I know we don't have a lot of time, but uh, try and share a couple. Like there's one one organization where they've actually using AI and drones where they can plant uh, trees. They'll actually plant these seeds with the hyper nutrients and stuff. And they can, each drone can plant 10,000 trees a day. Um, but they're also looking at cities and having the AI to wear concrete. I mean, that's that's one simple example on trying to create a little greener city. I mean, there's stuff Ocean Health Alliance is doing. I mean, there's stuff across the board. It's just I think that maybe it doesn't get as much notoriety as it should. But I, ironically, we always talk about this might be the century of the machine. I actually find this might be the century of the human, that technology like AI is actually giving us this, a chance to explore ourselves, explore nature, and form a deeper connection. Great. Well, um, obviously, this is something we could talk about forever. I know I could certainly talk to Neil forever about this stuff. It's fascinating work. Uh, but we are out of time. Um, there was a question about slides. We uh, can certainly get the slides uh, to you. Um, so uh, you've got contact information here. I would actively ask you to do that. Um, other than that, we, we certainly through your representatives at Frost and Sullivan, we will make sure that you get a copy of the slides. They are fine. But if you need them urgently, please email one of us here and we will get a copy. But other than that, I want to thank you for your time.